Zero knowledge airdrop in which you enable anonymous governance where people's votes aren't impacted by other people's votes. Uh, where people can vote independently and they're only revealed once you want to tally the votes or once the voting period is over. In order to do this, to do a zero knowledge airdrop, you need a way to avoid double claiming. That is, people can anonymously claim their tokens to an unlinked account, but still there is some identifier that represents them that prevents them from claiming the same airdrop twice. Or maybe we want to do an anonymous message board in which we know. Uh, that each of the people cannot be identified. But we know, for instance, that maybe the first poster is the same as the third poster. Or imagine we want to do anonymous voting within a large anonymity set, such that the very first person to vote has the full power of every single person in this anonymity set. Or really, any civil-resistant anonymous application. So we thought about what we could use to be this kind of tool that stops us from double spending and is this kind of unique identifier of someone on chain. And after talking a bunch on Discord, we decided to create a new ZK nullifier scheme on ECDSA. This is joint work uh, with Personi Labs, Geometry Research, and uh, originally done at Xerox Park and MIT. So to kind of clarify what exactly this nullifier is, let's try to maybe go through some properties. So if you want to avoid people from double spending and we want each person to claim only once, then we need this property, this, this identifier outputted by this account to be unique. That is, everyone should have a different one. We also want this value to be deterministic. That is, if I have some Ethereum public-private key pair, I should only be able to generate one of these signals. Finally, the signal I generate should be verifiable without access to my secret key. This is because in a ledger wallet or in a secure enclave, it's not possible to even read the secret key or take it out of the secure enclave. We also don't want users copy-pasting their private keys all over the place. And finally, we want this number, the scheme, to be completely non-interactive. If you've heard of nullifiers before, you might have heard of something like Tornado Cash or Semaphore. And the way that works is that as people sign up, the anonymity set grows bigger and bigger and bigger. However, the first person to use Tornado Cash or the first person to sign up for a Semaphore group has zero anonymity until more people join. But if we want the full power of the entire anonymity set for the very first person, we need the scheme to be non-interactive. That is, there shouldn't be two phases, like a sign-up phase and a utility phase. So to understand these properties a little bit more, one useful exercise is to go through some examples of schemes that may work or may not work. So imagine when we wanted someone to post this deterministic value that identified themselves, that stopped them from double claiming or stopped them from double voting, that they used the hash of a deterministic ECDSA signature. Now, you might guess that this has all the properties we want. It's unique. If you're signing a message, um, a deterministic signature, there should only be one. Um, it's, it's uh, non-interactive, anyone can generate a signature and blend into the anonymity set. Uh, you don't need people to, to interact and sign up for the scheme first. However, the issue with deterministic ECDSA signatures is that you cannot verify that a deterministic ECDSA signature was generated with the correct deterministic randomness unless you have access to the private key. That is, deterministic ECDSA signatures are identical to non-deterministic ECDSA signatures except that the randomness is like the hash of the private key. And so if you're trying to verify this on chain or in a ZK-SNARK, you would need the private key. So it doesn't quite achieve what we want it to achieve. A second idea is this idea called a verifiable unpredictable function, or a unique signature. Now, the vast majority of the schemes for these are on pairing-friendly curves, and Ethereum, which is on ECDSA, on SecB, 256K1, is not a pairing-friendly curve. So the vast majority of this literature is fairly inaccessible to us. We could try something like hash of message comma public key. You'd imagine this is unique. Every account, every public key has a different value of this hash. It's deterministic. If you have a public key and there's some message, say the app ID, then this hash is deterministic. It's verifiable without your private key. And it's non-interactive. You can give this hash without signing up in advance. Now, the issue with this is that it's a little bit subtle, but it's actually possible to de-anonymize people who are using this for anonymity. The way you do that is you can take the list of all 200, 400 million private keys on Ethereum, calculate the hash values for every single one, and match it up with this nullifier value on chain. And boom, you've de-anonymized a person who tried to use this as their unique identifier. Maybe kind of getting inspired by this, we can try something like hash of message comma secret key. You'd imagine this is similar to the, the public key case, except you can't take everyone's secret key on chain because you don't know everyone's secret key. So it's not possible to de-anonymize people in the same way. But the issue is to verify something that's behind a hash, you have to calculate the entire hash function inside the zero knowledge proof or inside whatever identity primitive you're using. 
and we don't want to use this to copy around the secret key, and so this scheme isn't quite it. So finally, we resolved on this scheme. We use a hash of message, comma, public key to the power of secret key. It's kind of similar to the other schemes, but it turns out that it has this nice property that it's a DDH VRF, or a decisional Diffie-Hellman verifiable random function. And specifically, what this means is that we can verify that this is actually calculated correctly without access to the secret key. So to maybe summarize like, what exactly the properties we are, uh, that we want so far, is that we want this deterministic function of a user's secret key that can be verified with only their public key and keeps them anonymous. And the way we do this is we define a new deterministic signature scheme on Ethereum. So I'm going to try to go through what exactly the signature scheme is. And so this is going to get a little bit mathy. And I've tried to slightly color code the numbers that are the same so that you can kind of correlate them across. Um, and although the math is a little bit difficult to understand on first glance, I'll try to give you an intuition for why it achieves the properties that we want it to achieve. So remember our nullifier was the hash of message comma public key to the power of secret key. And so this value will be public. It will be calculated inside the user's wallet, whether it's their MetaMask or their ledger or anything else. Um, and this value will stay public the entire time. It will be posted on chain eventually for everyone to see. These private outputs will be created by the wallet and given to the user. These Outputs, if they were seen by the external world, could de-anonymize a user. For instance, if you saw their public key, you would obviously know who they are. Um, and so the idea is that these signals are kept to the user, and the user can use them to generate a ZK-SNARK. So what the user does is once they have these signals, you can think of this as splitting the signature scheme into a deterministic part, the nullifier, and the non-deterministic part, the private part. The verifier simply checks these values were calculated correctly. Now, it's a little bit hard to dive, dive through all this math, so I'm going to try to give like a high-level overview of why we have this kind of C value floating around. Now, the reason we have this like C value floating around is that when you're taking a hash, it's impossible to brute force the output of the hash. So you must know all the inputs that went into the hash. This means that the person, you can kind of think of this C commitment as a hash commitment to these values of g to the r, to our nullifier, to our public key. And then we calculate this value, which is S, which is based on the C value, which we know must have been calculated after C. And notice that this S value does not reveal the user's secret key. Although it has secret key in it, it's blinded by a completely random number. The check in the snark, you'll also notice, has no secret keys in it. We only pass in these signals, none of which you can use to derive the user's original secret key. And the check that we do is effectively, did the user calculate C in the correct order? Did they commit to their secret key, their public key, and calculate the signature in a way that would have actually proved that they owned that secret key. And finally, the ZK snark, apart from checking that the nullifier was calculated correctly in a deterministic fashion um, on the correct curve, we also check whatever public key check we want to do. This allows us to verify that the public key is in fact acting correctly and has some unique identifier, but now we have to verify that the public key is in fact allowed to interact with this protocol. Maybe they're in a Merkle proof, maybe they submit a Merkle try Patricia proof that they, are, they satisfy some condition on chain. And the idea is that we would also lump this in with the verifier check in the ZK snark. So to summarize, the wallet generates these signals, the user plugs them into a ZK snark, and posts the ZK snark with the public nullifier output on chain, proving that they are allowed to interact with this protocol and a unique user who is still going to be kept anonymous. Now, interestingly, when we were doing this work, we discovered this quantum secrecy interactivity trade-off. Now, it turns out that Semaphore is extremely quantum secure because it uses hashes. But it's not in, it is interactive, meaning that you have two phases, and the first people that interact, that interact with the protocol have no anonymity. Our scheme, on the other hand, is fully non-interactive. The very first person to use the nullifier will have the full anonymity of the entire anonymity set. However, it is not quantum secure. And the way that you can kind of think about quantum adversaries in this situation is that a quantum adversary can effectively take discrete log and prime factorizations, but it can't undo hashes. So you can imagine that when we have a quantum computer with 2,000 signal qubits that can break all of Ethereum's uh, public keys and derive their private keys. In the actual situation of the chain continuing, this is completely fine. Users can sign their new key with their old key before quantum supremacy occurs, and the entire chain can move seamlessly to a new quantum-resistant system. However, if you can derive all the user's secret keys, then if you remember the trick we did in the very beginning, where we calculate the has of message come a public key for all the users and de-anonymize people, we can do the exact same thing with this quantum adversary calculated secret key. Quantum adversary simply calculates every secret key for every, private, uh, for every public key on Ethereum, calculates the nullifiers for every single one of these keys, and matches them up with the anonymous signal. And so, interestingly, 
any future quantum adversary can break past anonymity. Um, and the issue is that actually any deterministic nullifier scheme that has the properties that I defined in the beginning has this vulnerability because if you source randomness from only the secret key, that means the quantum adversary can derive it as well. And so you have to source randomness beyond the secret key, which requires the user to remember that value, which means you need to have a password. So to kind of get a better intuition for like whether this actually matters or not, uh, there is the, the predictions of quantum researchers vary extremely widely. Some researchers have mentioned they think it's going to come as soon as 30 years, signal qubits that can break ECDSA. Some researchers think somewhere around 100 years, and some think that because of the noise problem, it's theoretically impossible and it will never happen. Um, it's a little unclear. Uh, as of right now, we have about 20 signal qubits, and we need over 2,000 to break ECDSA. So I've, I've written a short mental model that you can read once you look at the link on the slides, which describes kind of how I think about this quantum mental model of how these systems are going to evolve and whether or not we should be worried about it. But I think for now, the decision that we made is that it makes more sense to not be worried about quantum oracles because as long as the protocols are transparent that you will be de-anonymized in something between 30 and 100 years, the idea is that most people probably won't care because by that time, for instance, even governments declassify de de their secret documents in this kind of time frame. So to understand more how this nullifier scheme is going and if you can use it yourself, we have a paper in which we proved all the security properties of this nullifier scheme. Um, we have a blog post that's gonna be coming up on the Personi Labs blog soon. And we also have a proof of concept uh, in Rust and in a MetaMask snap finished. Um, the next step is to put it into a ton of other wallets, into Ledger, into burner wallets, into MetaMask Core, create an ERC standard for people to use this scheme so that we can have unique anonymity across the board, and uh, to potentially write an appendix to an IETF RFC to make it uh, a complete standard across all of cryptography. If you're interested in seeing more about the code, um, this link will link you to our GitHub repo where we have all the open source code. We'll be linking to all the slides here as well, along with the quantum mental model, um, and our Twitter if you want to learn more. Um, if you guys are interested in this, uh, want to use the scheme, or are curious about uh, pseudonymity, uh, I'd be happy to talk, and it would be really fun to see where the scheme can go. And if anyone has any questions about understanding the scheme or thoughts on where it can or can't be used, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions for the next five or ten minutes. Test. Okay. How is the scheme called? So right now the scheme is called just a ZK nullifier because we think this is the kind of most straightforward way to describe what is going on. Um, but I'm open to any other name suggestions. I think uh, there's a question in the front. Can you like explain, uh, probably maybe using an example, how uh, like this non-interactive uh, is like is like seen in practice, like in terms of like uh, using the scheme, like maybe like an airdrop. Like, can you explain like how that system would work, how like user would interact, and like kind of that maintain that property? Yeah, that's a great question. I can maybe go through the kind of the whole airdrop scheme and try to describe why it wouldn't be practical with something like semaphore, but why it could be practical with something like the nullifier. So if you imagine the semaphore scheme for the airdrop, the way it would look is that people would first have to sign up to receive the airdrop. Um, and this is the people who have to submit their semaphore commitment to some uh, either like an on-chain directory or an off-chain list. And the issue with this is that people can then Sybil attack this airdrop very easily because they know that an airdrop is going to be coming and this is a way to gain eligibility for it. And so because they have this two-step process, People can spam whatever mechanism it is that they're using to determine who is eligible and who is not, um, resulting in this being a somewhat impractical solution. Um, you can also imagine that if you didn't have a two-phase process, where instead people could sign up for the semaphore keys whenever and claim whenever, and the very first person to claim the airdrop would sign up for the semaphore key, you would see only one semaphore key in the list of all semaphore keys, and then that person would claim their airdrop. And so you would know that the person who posted that proof must have been the person who claimed the airdrop. And so, as a result, the small anonymity set is, is not ideal if you're trying to maintain perfect anonymity for everyone in the set. The way the nullifier scheme would work is that when you claim the airdrop, you prove that you have a nullifier for a message like, I am claiming the ZK airdrop. And the verifier would prove that you in fact signed that message, that you created your deterministic nullifier correctly, and would allow you to claim the airdrop and then add that nullifier to a block list from ever claiming again. And so what would happen is the very first person to claim, no one would know who they are out of the entire set of all the keys that are eligible for the airdrop. Where does the like, NFT eventually end? Like it's an Ethereum address versus uh, like, is it like the things are happening on chain or it's like an off-chain process or like? Uh... 
just trying to uh, understand that. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for those who didn't hear the beginning, the question was basically, how is the ZK airdrop actually implemented? And the idea is that what you would do is you would prove that you own an account that is in the Merkle tree of eligible addresses for this ZK airdrop. You would generate a semaphore nullifier for that scheme uh, in the original case, and then you would claim it to a completely unlinked, unused account that has never had any th transaction on Ethereum. Um, in the nullifier scheme, you do a similar thing. You would prove you have an account in this Merkle tree. You would prove ownership of that account. You would prove the nullifier via the deterministic nullifier scheme. And similarly, the tokens would go to a completely new, fresh Ethereum account that has no history on it and is effectively anonymous. Yeah, that's a great question, though. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so just to expand on the, the previous question, like a concrete example, say you wanted to like airdrop an, NF an NFT to anyone who has a CryptoPunk. And, but you want people to be able to claim it without revealing which punk they are. Um, with a semaphore or anything that's like a two-step, your anonymity set is only going to be the amount of people who like sign up for the semaphore. And with this, the anonymity, even if it's just two people that end up claiming this NFT, they have the full anonymity set of like all punk, hold all punk holders, if that makes sense. And it's going to like a new address, not to the one that has the punk. Hello. All right. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, can you... Um, Expand a bit upon if you uh, if you use this scheme for a uh, sort of a, a multi-step protocol where it's not just maybe a, a tornado cash deposit and withdrawal or a claim scheme, but you continue where you maybe have some sort of um, a transfer of private assets within the anonymity set. Uh, do you keep that anonymity, and and how does that work? Yeah, so the, the way dark pool transfers would kind of work with this anonymity, with this nullifier, is that the way most people enter a dark pool is they send their assets to like a specific smart contract. And so you already know that the anonymity set is limited to everyone who has ever interacted with a smart contract. And one thing you could do is you could use something like Semaphore, and if you interact with a smart contract, the guarantee is that you have to sign up for a Semaphore key. So because the anonymity set is already limited by something like an on-chain interaction, the nullifier wouldn't add additional anonymity because it's already limited by the chain interactions. However, what it could do is prevent you from having to memorize secret notes. So for instance, with Tornado Cash, you have to download a string and remember it forever. Um, and if you lose that string, then you lose your money. But what you could do with this scheme is that instead of having to memorize a Tornado Cash note, you just remember the amount of money you got. And then you could say, OK, I got one ETH, so I'm going to sign a message saying Tornado Cash one ETH. And I know that the nullifier that it creates will be a valid note for my deposit. And the contract can simply validate that. And so it can help uh, saving uh, memory or losing strings for anonymous money, but it wouldn't add significantly additional anonymity if the original scheme was implemented uh, with the dark pool correctly sending to the contract. Yeah, that's a great question, though. Hey, hi. Uh, OK. Uh, I I'm pretty sure like many of us would have read about nullifiers for the first time in Vitalik's article the one with like privacy applications for GKs right. now. And like I did not understand it completely, but I thought it was Vitalik who wrote it, so it must be true. <laughs> so, so can you like just uh, give a brief difference between that nullifier technique and your nullifier technique for us to compare? Right, uh, so the nullifier technique that is classically referred to in mostly ZK snark posts um, is another fire technique that exists, which is uh, kind of what Halo 2 defined a number of years ago. And it's kind of evolved into being this semaphore type scheme, in which another fire just represents that you can't double claim or double interact with a specific protocol, because that nullifier nullifies your ability to do so. Um, the idea is we get added to a smart contract or something, and then uh, when you interact with that in the future, it would notice that you've already interacted with it before, and then stop that transaction from going through. Um, so the scheme that likely is being referred to that in that post is likely a semaphore type scheme or a, a sign-up type scheme in which this nullifier is like a hash of some string, um, which again would have to be interactively generated. Um, and so when I, when I say this kind of semaphore side or this like interactive side, that's largely the, the, the classical nullifier that I'm referring to. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I had a general question, yeah. um, kind of about coming back to the example of the token-gated airdrop. So if you either use like the ZK nullifier or semaphore, to generate a proof um, that an address is eligible for an airdrop based on um, owning an NFT in a set, for example. How does that respond to updates, for example, when you transfer the NFT afterwards? Since the nullifier is only tied to the address, could you then transfer that NFT to a different address and create another nullifier and again qualify for the airdrop? Yes, yeah, so it's a great question. So 
the way that you would solve this kind of multiple qualifying for the airdrop problem is that when you define, when you release this airdrop, you define like a strict set of keys that are eligible for this airdrop. It can be, say, like people who owned a certain NFT at a certain block, in which case there's a finite number of addresses that can claim that. Um, or it can be, so anything you could prove in the Ethereum storage uh, Merkle Patricia try, or it could be like a just a list of addresses in a Merkle tree, like a standard airdrop is done. Um, and so the idea is that even the, the reason the nullifier is used is it would only suffice for this claiming step. Because once you've claimed the nullifier to an account, uh, and you've claimed this NFT or airdrop or whatever to this account, that account can do whatever it wants with that information. Now it's, it's come from a completely anonymous source, and so it can, it can go wherever, and it'll continue to maintain that anonymity. So the, you can continue to trans transact that NFT or ERC20, but you just wouldn't be interacting with the original airdrop contract ever again. So you wouldn't need a nullifier in the future. Yeah. OK, good. So this is probably a silly question. Uh, when people redeem it, right, they have to provide some guess. So the guess must be coming from some account. So even, even though we have all these anonymities um, probably hide the, the address that's going to receive it, but uh, when people provide the guess, this transaction actually links the account that's receiving the NFT versus the account having the guess. So it's still revealing like some information. Yeah, that's a great question. The question was basically, how do you pay for the gas um, without de-anonymizing yourself? And there's kind of two main ways to do this. One is uh, the airdrop contract itself will pay for the gas. So the way this would work is when you claim, uh, the airdrop contract would record the amount of gas being used in the transaction. There would be a certain bank inside the contract to pay for that gas, um, plus a little bit extra. And so the idea is that you could send your claim transaction on chain, uh, or uh, to a private mempool, and an MEV searcher would actually be incentivized to claim this transaction, act as your relayer in a decentralized manner because they're getting compensated for it uh, because the contract is calculating and reimbursing them more than they would have paid for the gas. That's one way to do it. Second way to do it is something like account abstraction, where you can, again, have a third party pay for the gas, usually out of the contract. This can happen with, say, the contract doing an atomic swap with, say, the token that it's giving you and ETH to pay for the gas. Um, Similarly, reimbursing the, the front-running relayer effectively. Um, or you could send it to like a, a, something like a Keeper Network, which would incentivize, which is basically a place where MEV searchers can post, uh, or people can post MEV ideas and MEV searchers can take them. You could use a mempool or you could use a kind of a private centralized or decentralized method to do that. Yeah, that's a great transaction. That's a great question, though. Thank awesome. you so much, Hajush. Big round of applause.